Hey, Scott, are you there? What about you, Dan? Yep, I'm here. Awesome. Mr. Scott, are you here? Hey, Lorley. Hey, Debbie. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Doing good. It was by his part, I think, on our list. Sorry. Oh. Mr. Durham, how are you this evening? I'm well, and you? That's awesome. Can we check your, oh, there you are. Your video looks good and you sound great. I, I don't know how good I'm going to do with this computer stuff, but this is, <laughs> I'm going to give it a whirl. Well, you're doing awesome so far. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Scott, are you there? Hey, Nathan, how are you? Hey, doing good. How are you? Doing good. We see your video and we hear your audio. So that's okay. great. All right. I'm ready then. Thank you. Mr. David Glenn, are you here? Yes, ma'am. How are you doing? Doing awesome. How about you this evening? Good, good. Hey, Nathan. Good. How are you doing? Start. doing good, Dave. Huh? How are you? Good, good. <laughs> My room is too dark. Paula, is that you talking earlier? Hey, Nathan, I'm here. Oh, hey, okay. I wasn't sure if that was you or not, was, but now I can tell. It was, it was, De it was Debbie. She's oh, helping okay. us out. Gotcha. <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing good, Paula. How are you? Doing good. I'm like their official Walmart greeter, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Paula, how many more are we waiting on? We are officially waiting on four, including Doug. You're right. Oh, yeah, right. Of course. I can send him a text, see where he is. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, I sent him a message. You said it's not letting him in, so I'm going to send him a link. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Anna, um, Paula just sent him a reminder as well. So, hopefully, um, if he needs help, we can give him a call and, and try to troubleshoot with him. Sweet. Hello, Mr. Fadri, are you here tonight? Hello. How are you? Oh, uh, I am just lovely. <laughs> awesome. Okay, well, we see your audio and your video sounds good, so we'll get started in a minute. Oh, Lisa, let your switch to Hi, Lisa. Hey, how are you? Can you hear me? Yes, and we can see you as well. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks for having me. Hey Scott, are you here? Here's Doug. I am here. Awesome, that's great. Well, let me see. You want to <laughs> check out your video? There I'm it here. Is. For a second. All right. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Hey Doug. Doug, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you see me? <laughs> yeah, we see you. You had a little trouble. Yeah, I did. I kept hitting the submit button and it kept saying not doing anything. But anyway, kind of work, got around it. Thank you. You got it now. So and that's thanks, awesome. And thanks back to Anna too for trying to help. All right. Yes. Thanks, Anna. No problem. All right. We're ready to go then. Yeah. Yep, I think you're good to go. All right, I'd like to call this habitat and water quality meeting into order. Of course, the primary uh, purpose of this meeting is a new advisor orientation and an MFC update. And since we're doing a virtual meeting, um, we'd like to do a roll call for attendance. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll go ahead and start. If I say your name, you can just um, reply present or say here, and then if you are new, if this is your first meeting, we are going to ask you just real, real simply, quickly, tell us who, you know, where you're from or a little bit about you, why, why you want to be on this great um, advisory committee. So um, first, Jack Durham. I'm here, present. I'm new. Uh, don't know what to expect. Uh, I'm was interested in the water quality part, and that's why I put an application. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. David Glenn. Hey, good evening and uh, present. Uh, I, this is my second time being on the Habitat Water Quality. It was, I served a six year term uh, a couple years ago. Uh, I work for the National Weather Service over here in Newport, Moorhead City. So I'm all about weather and climate and the impacts on habitat. So 
um, grateful to be back on board again. Thank you. James Hall is absent. Nathan Hall. Uh, that's me. Um, can y'all hear me? Okay. Make sure I okay. wasn't muted. Um, yeah, present and David's the one that talked me into being on this, or he told <laughs> me about it. And I'm very happy to be here. I deal with water quality at work and. You are a water quality guru. We're glad to have you. Glad Thank you. Um, Scott Leahy. I'm here. Been on board Mark for on Parish. a couple years. I didn't see him. I don't think Markham is here. Um, Lisa Ryder. Thanks, Ann. Lisa Ryder. I work for Coastal Carolina River Watch. We are a um, Waterkeeper Alliance affiliated organization that covers coastal North Carolina, and we deal heavily in water quality and habitat protection. Um, our watershed jurisdiction is the White Oak River Basin, which is from um, basically Cedar Island all the way down to Hampstead, and we partner with others in our coalition that make our efforts statewide. Um, we also have a program called Water Quality for Fisheries, which is where my um, interest started in um, concerns that we have um, that we'd like to address within this um, committee. So thanks for having me. Great. Thank you, Lisa. <clears throat> Mark Sonder. Uh, present and I am new. Um, my company is uh, H2O Captain Echo Tour Private Boat Excursions. I'm lucky enough to have a commercial use authorization permit from the National Park Service to take passengers uh, via boat over to Shack, uh, but not where the ferry goes, however. Um, I anchor the boat and walk with them on the island to see the wild horses um, and walk over to the other side, to the ocean side, to perform uh, some great shelling. Um, also, the um, creator, producer, writer, and voice behind the Boating Safety Minute uh, heard on three uh, local radio stations daily from mid-March through mid-October on, if I can say the call letters, numbers 92.9 and 107.1 FM, as well as 12.40 AM. Uh, I serve in the U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary as a past flotilla commander, and I'm also one of the admittance partners to the U.S. Coast Guard Academy in New London, Connecticut. Uh, and I also happen to be an expert or a former expert uh, whitewater kayaker with two first descents to my name, one in upstate New York and one in the country of Chile. And I'm very... Uh, Grateful and honored to be here amongst uh, everybody on this committee. Well, thank you. All right, Doug Ryder. Uh, President, uh, Marine Fisheries Commissioner and co-chair with Anna. Thank you. And Anna Schellen. Present. All righty, that's it. We have a quorum. All right, so our first order of business is to approve the agenda. Um, are there any modifications that need to be made to the agenda? If not, then um, we can entertain a motion to approve the agenda. Motion to approve the agenda. Thank you. Do we have a second? I'll second. Scott. Thank you. Yes. Um, all right. Okay. Uh, okay. We'll do another roll. We'll do another um, uh, vote. Um, because roll. It's virtual. Right. So yeah. you can just say yay or nay, yes or no. Um, Jack Durham. Yay. And David Glenn. Yay. And Joel Padre. Yay. Nathan Hall. Yay. Scott Lee. Yay. And Markham Parrish. Yay. And Lisa Ryder. Yay. Mark Sonder. Yay. Doug Rader. Yay. And Anna Schell. 
Yay. Yes. Perfect. Then we need to approve the minutes from the October 25th meeting. Do we have a motion to approve the minutes from the meeting? Uh, Anna? Yes. This is Laura. I'm sorry. Can I um, ask that um, one thing we want to make sure is that when everyone is um, either making motions or, or um, seconding motions, if they could just say their name before they speak, um, just so people online who are listening can uh, know who's speaking. <clears throat> Please. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you. All right. So do we have a motion to approve the October 25th meeting minutes? Doug will make that motion since I was present. Doug, thank you. Do we have a second? This is Nathan. Well, I'll second. Thank you, Nathan. Hey, I'll do a roll call again. Yes or no? Jack Durham. Jack Durham, do you approve the minutes? Yay, I do. Okay. And David Glenn. David Glenn, yay. Joel Fadry. Uh, Joel, yay. Thank you. Uh, Nathan Hall. Nathan Hall, yay. 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 Okay. Scott Lee. Yay. Scott Lee. Mark and Parrish. Yay. Mark Parrish. Thank you. Lisa Ryder. Yay. Thank you. Mark Sonder. Mark Sonder, abstain. Okay. And Doug Rader. Yay. Motion. And Anna Shelm. Yay. All right. Minutes so are approved. Next, we have our AC orientation, and I'll hand it over to Laura. Thank you very much. And I'm just going to get my presentation loaded up here. So it should be just a second. For those of you that are new to the virtual meeting, um, at the bottom right corner of your screen, you'll see a little hand that's up. And if you'd like to speak, click on that. And so we can keep you in the queue. And then when you're done speaking, make sure to hit it again so we don't come back to you. Almost there. I'm so close. <laughs> okay. Up and running. Anna, can you see it? Yes, I can. Thank you so much. All right. So. Um, as Anna said, my name is Laura Klebanski, and I am the MFC liaison. So first, I want to say welcome to all of our new advisors and also welcome back to those of you who are returning. Um, I really look forward to working with you all this year. Um, since tonight's meeting is only two hours um, and we do have some other business to get to, uh, this is going to be a pretty brief orientation that is going to focus primarily on the duties of the advisory committee. So my goal tonight is just to begin what will hopefully be an ongoing learning experience for all of us. Um, and of course, there's a lot more to cover, um, but we do have to begin somewhere. So tonight it's going to be with the overview of the duties and also to look at um, what that looks like in the context of our annual meeting cycle. So um, while this will be quick, uh, I do want you to know that myself and my staff are always available to any of you for questions. So if you have any after this or after the meeting, please do feel free to reach out to us. We are um, here for you and to help you through this process. All right, so um, first I want to briefly touch on the fact that North Carolina is celebrating its 200th anniversary of fisheries management this year. So. As you can imagine, a lot has changed in those 200 years. Um, for our purposes today, I want to mention two specific dates in history. So the first date is December of 1822. And at that time, the first fisheries legislation was passed here in North Carolina. Um, and it was titled an act to prevent the destruction of oysters and other purposes. 
So just to drop that into history for you, in 1822, James Monroe was the fifth president of the United States, and the number of states had just increased to 24 when Missouri was admitted the year before. So this first legislation set gear restrictions, it established an oyster season, it created fines to deter non-resident oyster harvests, and it also prohibited, it also prohibited, excuse me, the transport transport of oysters out of the state. So even way back in 1822, there were um, pr some pretty substantial concerns about over harvest, um, especially by out of state fishermen. So from this very early beginning, fisheries management in the state evolved from a focus on the single fishery, the oyster fishery, to many other species, um, and also to include regulation of what were the evolving commercial and recreational sectors. So this leads to the second point in time that I want to cover, which is 1997. So this was the year that the Fisheries Reform Act was passed, and it ushered in a new way of managing fisheries in the state. On the screen here, you can see a quote from the preamble of the Fisheries Reform Act, which says, the General Assembly recognizes the need to protect our coastal fishery resources and to balance the commercial and recreational interests for better management of these resources. So the Fisheries Reform Act was a remarkable cooperative effort by legislators, fisheries managers, scientists, and both commercial and recreational stakeholders. And it made a lot of changes to the way that the fishery, uh, fisheries are managed in the state. Um, it did this by restructuring the Marine Fisheries Commission, um, including adding these advisory committees, mandating, uh, it mandated the development of uh, fishery management and also coastal habitat protection plans, and it implemented a new licensing structure. So tonight, we are not going to go through the full FRA. We do not have time to do that, but we can start here. So um, I want to bring your attention to a single Fishery Reform Act statute, which is on the screen here, and it's NCAC 143B-289.57. So this is the law that established the advisory committees. Um, I have not included the full text of this because it is pretty long, but I do want you to see um, in the title, you can see that this law established membership, um, it established the com uh, committees themselves, and also the selection of the advisory committees. And tonight I'm going to focus on the final noun in that list, um, the duties that this law describes. So I've pulled the duties language from the body of the law, and those are displayed on the screen here. So the first duty of the advisory committees is to assist the commission in the performance of its duties by reviewing all matters referred to the committee by the commission and shall make findings and recommendations on these matters. The second one that you'll see here is that the standing committees may make findings and recommendations as to any matter related to its subject area. The commission shall consider all findings and recommendations. So now that we've read that law, let's discuss what that looks like in action. So as I mentioned earlier, the FRA mandated two types of management plans, the fishery management plans and the coastal habitat protection plan. So both of these are described in statute, but they differ in their development and their adoption. The CHIP is actually a collaborative process with two other commissions within the Department of Environmental Quality, um, while the fishery management plans are solely under the authority of the Marine Fisheries Commission. So because of this, the majority of actions that are undertaken by the Marine Fisheries Commission are associated with these processes um, and really heavily on the marine fishery, um, the fishery management plans. So, um, the um, what that means is that because this is where most of those actions come from for the commission, um, that means that most of the action items that come before you are also from these same processes. So here on the screen, what you can um, see is a simplified representation of the FMP process. So again, I'm going to focus on the FMP process because, as I said, it is the most frequent path by which the MFC refers matters to you, the, the advisory committees. 
So here I've highlighted in orange the point in the FMP process at which the Commission approves a draft FMP document and then sends it to you, the advisory committees, and also to the general public for review. So this is the point in the formal FMP process where you fulfill that first duty that we discussed. So while this represents the primary way by which you assist the Commission in their duties, there are other opportunities for you to provide informal feedback, um, in some cases formal feedback, <laughs> to division staff and the Commission um, as these plans are being developed, as well as opportunities for you to refer matters to the Commission itself. Um, and this is covered under that second um, duty, which again, you can see here that the standing committees may make findings and recommendations as to any matter related to its subject area. For this committee, it's habitat and water quality. So the commission shall consider all findings and recommendations. So that's our, our duty. So, for example, at these quarterly meetings, um, you'll receive updates from myself and staff on various issues. Um, this is primarily to keep you up to speed on commission business and also provides you an opportunity um, to ask questions and provide feedback. So an example of this is tonight's informal opportunity for you to discuss and provide comment to the DMF lead biologists on the strike mullet supplement, which is currently out for review by the public. Um, so again, there's no specific referral from the commission in this case. Um, rather, it's just an opportunity for you as the advisors to provide thoughts or feedback to staff and the commission. So, seeing this one little bar um, in this much bigger process may not seem like a lot, but we currently have 13 fishery management plans, which are reviewed approximately every five years. And with the additional updates and discussions, the advisory committee calendar can fill up very quickly. So, to help coordinate all these moving pieces, um, we've developed a Marine Fishery Commission work plan. Um, I've put this on the screen and I recognize fully that this is completely impossible to read, but um, I'm putting it here just so you know that it exists and also that it's available for um, your use. So it's updated after each commission meeting um, and is part of the chairman's briefing materials at the beginning of the following meeting. So we use this as a tracking tool to monitor the various topics from the commission and also the division um, that they're working on over approximately a two year period. So this can be very helpful if you're wondering, say, when the Klamath Oyster FMP um, is gonna be coming to you. So when that draft docu document would be coming to you for comment. Um, I do recommend that you review this document at least once a year. So you have a sense of what might be coming up for your review in the near future. Um, it's also a good way for you to plan ahead in terms of preparation for these meetings. So, for example, it gives you the opportunity to listen to discussions at the MFC meetings, to speak to staff, or just generally review documents as they're released at various points in the process. So, this is one tool that is available on the Division of Marine Fisheries website. Um, however, there are many, many more. Um, and this includes all of the Marine Fishery Commission briefing materials, all of the recordings of previous meetings, um, Division of Marine Fishery review documents, including the annual FMP reviews and the big book, which is a huge document that we put out every year that contains all of the statistics, I think, from the previous 10 years that the division um, releases. So um, I don't want to, uh, my intention is not to overwhelm you at this point, but I do want you to know that you have a plethora of resources available to you as advisors. And that gets me to um, the Marine Fisheries Commission office. So um, here on the screen are the Marine Fishery Commission, um, and that includes you as advisors, support staff. So three of us are housed within the Division of Marine Fisheries. And the Marine Fisheries Commission attorney is housed in the Department of Justice. So the in-house staff are myself, um, Paula Farnell, who is our program assistant, and also Catherine Bloom, who is our rulemaking coordinator. And we're available to you anytime you have questions or concerns about any action or anything, basically. We serve as a guide not only to your service on the MFC um, advisory committees, but also to the division itself. So, 
um, we are a really good place to start um, and can get generally get you where you're going. So speaking of Paula, she's here with me tonight. <laughs> And I'm going to um, hand it over to her just briefly so she can uh, introduce herself and just say hi. I know many of you have been working on onboarding documents and things like that. So, Paula, go ahead. I'm just going to briefly wave. Hi, guys. I'm Paula. <laughs> uh, most of you have talked to me. A few of you have met me. A few of you have met me in my previous uh, roles and past jobs. So it's nice to see some familiar faces come back around, too. Um, I'm just excited to be here and work with you guys. As Laura mentioned, just reach out, please. Um, I myself am new, as I've told many of you, so be patient with me, but um, I will definitely point you in the right direction. If I don't know how to answer your question, I will find where you need to go. So feel free to just reach out at any point, um, and I'm looking forward to working with all of you. Thanks, Paula. Okay, with that, so as I said, there's a lot to cover. There's tons of information on the division website. Um, I do want to point you to one item that we included in your meeting materials for this meeting, which was a presentation titled Stock, Incess Stock Assessment 101. And uh, hopefully you all had a chance to watch it before you came tonight. If not, that's okay. You can watch it after. Um, but we do have Laura Lee, who is the division's lead stock assessment scientist, on with us tonight. So um, if anyone would like to ask questions of Laura Lee or get further explanation, she is here tonight. So feel free to um, jump in and, and let us know if you have any questions on that. Um, and um, I do want to let you know that after these January AC meetings, the uh, Marine Fishery Commission office, that's Paula and I, will be sending out an overview of the year ahead as well as links to the information that we've referenced here. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out um, to us again with any questions. Um, we want to try to help make this process as smooth as possible so that you have the opportunity to provide feedback to this commission and, and focus on that aspect of it. So that actually concludes my um, orientation presentation and I am happy to take any questions. If we don't have any questions, I believe there is a stock ass assessment presentation. Um, so we do this is this is Mark Sandra. I don't see the raised hand, but may I make may I ask a question? Absolutely. Sure. So findings and recommendations. If we do have a recommendation, singular or plural. Uh, do we put that in writing? Do we bring that up at a meeting? Do we come to your office and speak to you? What would you advise? So for um, the typically what we're referring to is any conversation that happens in this in these meetings, um, our findings, anything that the committee um, would like to put forward just in general conversation. Um, the committee also may make um, formal motions uh, if they would like and vote on sort of a, a more substantial um, motion or uh, something that they can put forward to the commission. Everything that occurs at these meetings, so all of the minutes from these meetings are provided to the Marine Fishery Commission, um, and they are also included um, generally in the staff updates. Uh, so the division marine fisheries staff will present to the marine fisheries commission um, at the uh, business meetings and they will report on the outcomes of these various meetings. Um, at the last marine fishery commission meeting, the, um, the vice chairman did request that the chairs of each of the committees uh, be available for questions at the Marine Fisheries Commission meeting so that they can answer questions if the commission had any further. So um, that's sort of a broad answer. I don't know if that answers specifically what you were asking. Uh, somewhat. A follow-up question then. It, would it be best to put a quote-unquote recommendation or let's just say a thought uh, on an upcoming 
agenda as one of the line items on the agenda? Um, for the for the committee, is that for the next committee meeting? Uh, as an example, yes. So, um, yes, you could do that. If there was an issue that you wanted to cover, you could request that it be put on the follow next meeting's agenda. And to make that presentation, is that best via email to you guys or to stop in your office? Um, so, uh, do you mean that you would bring a presentation of an issue for the consideration no. or? No, that you would, uh, one or all of us may make a recommendation that the committee may or may not wish to take up. And obviously you're the liaison and puts that on to the, uh, the agenda items. Um, so to put something on the agenda, is it best to put that in writing first or to verbally speak with you over the phone or to come into your office? What is the protocol? So at the end of the meeting on your on tonight's agenda, you'll see there's um, an item called staff updates and agenda planning. And so um, at the end of the meeting, following the public comment, the committee can any committee member can bring up items that will uh, that they'd like considered to be added to the next uh, meetings agenda. So that's that's really the appropriate time to bring it up is during the meeting. And I think, you know, of course, you can bring it up anytime during the meeting, but that's a specific time that's set aside for the committee members to bring up any agenda items. But it's still available to bring up to you in the next week or the next month or something like absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Well, and I will. Um, so we have a staff lead who works with me and Paula to help us with these meetings um, and Deaton. Uh, who is on the call with us tonight is our staff lead. So um, she and I will likely meet with the chairs of the committee and work on the agenda for next time. So we'll take all the feedback that we get, all the ideas, um, and then we'll set that agenda with the chair for the next meeting. And when you say we, I'm unclear right now who is speaking. Is oh, I'm sorry. Still... This is Laura. It's still Laura. It's still okay, Laura. very good. Yep. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Absolutely. My pleasure. Madam Chair, Doug, Doug Rader here. Can I make a comment, please, about this point? So, uh, Captain Saunders, in my view, uh, it's it's our job together or our opportunity together to consider the wide array of uh, issues that we might ourselves entertain and then come to a consensus on that we could move forward for Marine Fisheries Commission um, uh, attention and that those could be um, cross cutting and uh, unrelated to the ebb and flow of of fishery management plans as they come before us, or they could be related to those on the theory that the water quality and habitat effects on those same species that the uh, commission is moving forward with managing might make sense to consider, um, and perhaps in ways that go beyond what a stock assessment driven model by itself might, might bring. And while it is absolutely the case that the Marine Fisheries Commission's regulatory purview extends pretty much only to the direct regulation of those fisheries, its input through the Coastal Habitat Protection Planning process in coordination with the Coastal Resources Commission and, um, and the Environmental Management Commission that do have regulatory authority over habitat and water quality issues um, are, are woven together through that process. So we, we have an entry point I think to uh, both into the FMP process and into the, through the chip process into the broader universe of things. But because that is so all encompassing, at least in my personal view, it makes good sense to, for us to think about prioritizing those opportunities. And so what I think Anna and I were hoping we could do at the end of the day was in effect to pull all of you and gather those things together so that the two of us can then work with staff later to be able to pull some of those ideas and options and needs out for attention here. 
giving the staff adequate time to bring forward what they have already in hand. And there's already a tremendous wealth of material in the in the chip and also in other relevant uh, institutional plans by the South Atlantic Council, the Mid-Atlantic Council, and, and others. And so being able to pull those pieces in together as um, I don't want to anticipate what Ann's already done, but the, in your materials today, you probably saw the list of habitat issues that were pertinent to the hard clam and oyster fishery management plan listed in the spreadsheet. And so I think we'll have an opportunity together to sort of hammer out the things that we believe we ought to concentrate on. And then upon due process, this advisory committee taking a formal action, uh, then Anna and I working with staff can present that for response from the commission. So I think we do have a, a direct pathway there in that case, as well as in the case that that Laura already told you about related in terms of commenting on the, the FMPs as they come before us. So sorry about that, but, uh, but uh, I do think that your ideas are really important, all, all of you, and that we can weave them together after this meeting today about what those options might be. If anybody disagrees, let me know. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's just my view. <laughs> Are there any other questions? I believe we have a stock ass assessment presentation next. So we, we don't have a stock assessment presentation, but we do have um, our stock assessment scientist here. If anyone has questions or wants to talk more about the um, video that we provided in the um, meeting materials. So, um, Laura Lee, do you want to say hi and introduce yourself? Sure, sure Laura. Um, this is the other Laura that works for the division. Um, I'm the uh, stock assessment program manager, um, one of my staff created that video that Laura provided. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. If, if you don't have any tonight, feel free to get in touch with Laura and she can put you in touch with me um, if you you know think of questions down the line. I believe Next on the agenda would be looking over the um, striped mullet. Yeah, so um, I saw it, Doug, was Doug's hand up? Uh, I wasn't sure if he had it up yeah. from before. Yeah, it was. And I, I wondered, Laura, if um, you have any general thoughts for the committee about the, about the degree to which and how directly and indirectly habitat and water quality issues end up translating into stock assessments. In other words, looking at recruitment uh, issues and patterns and processes and changes in population abundance given warming waters or other changing conditions and things like that. What, is there anything particular that we ought to know about um, whether and how the purview of this advisory committee can be best uh, translated into useful information in terms of the stock assessment. I, was that for me, Doug, or was that for the other Laura? <laughs> that, that was, that, that was, it was a stock assessment like, question. Is she already gone? I don't think so. I think she's here. I just wanted to clarify. <laughs> I'm sure which Laura. I thought it was for the other Laura. <laughs> Start calling you Laura L and Laura K. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, that that's a really good um question, and and I I will ask the other Laura to help. She she can help me out with this one. Um, so. You know, we're still trying to understand the relationships between, you know, habitat and water quality and, and population dynamics of different fish stocks. Um, and, you know, it, it's always important to encourage research in those areas so we can, the more we understand, the better we can model those um, relationships. We do, when we are developing our um, indices of abundance that go into our stock assessment models, we do consider habitat 
and water quality variables in um, computing those indices. So that that's that's one area where the, the that information is used. Um, I know that in our last in the last big meeting we had with Stripe Mullet, a lot of uh, commercial commercial fishermen came forward discussing their concern about the water quality impacting the stock assessments more than than uh, anything more than the nets. And I'm wondering what kind of information or data we could gather to bring back to our next meeting when we have that discussion um, via you and, and the team. Like what 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 could we ask for in specific to um, to continue discussions in in regards to the striped mullet since it's such a uh, controversial issue? Um, I, Laura Lee, I'll take that if that's okay. okay. I, and you can jump in because I'm not going to talk about specifically stock assessment. I think that in terms of um, what goes into the stock assessment? I think those are more long term research questions that um, aren't necessarily specific to strike mullet, but rather just generally our understanding of the, you know, the habitat and water quality um, in our systems. But, um, and there's a lot of, I caveat that with a, there's a lot more to it, <laughs> but yeah. just for the sake yeah. of our time, um, I think that. Um, in terms of habitat and water quality, one thing that would be really important for understanding the striped mullet, it might be more um, in terms of understanding it for this immediate um, action items that are coming up, might just be a general understanding of what we know at this time. Um, cool. And then cool. working through the plan, as we do work through the plan, um, you know, thinking about as you as the commission makes these decisions trying to recognize especially from the perspective of water quality and habitat um, what are the pieces that you can see from your perspective or from the committee's perspective that might um, help improve the management outcomes for the fishery so um, i think it's i don't know that there's anything that we would bring back specifically at the next meeting but for example at the next meeting we do have um, a fishery characterization presentation that you're going to receive and so i think just keeping um you know there's a lot of different perspectives to look at that from and i think you know keeping in mind in the back of your mind as you're hearing that fisheries characterization and then your information or your knowledge about habitat and water quality in the back of your mind so you can sort of take that perspective on that information um, and and then you know thinking long term and I think as you go through that process you'll be able to um, identify uh, either for or or you know things that the staff have identified but maybe working towards prioritizing um, items you know based on the knowledge that's in this advisory committee. I hope that was helpful. I don't know if I got too far afield there. <laughs> um, so I just like to ask. What kind of, so the North Carolina Policy Collaboratory has funded a project through UNC. Joel's the head PI. I'm working on it. There's lots of other people working on it. And one of the things I'm looking at is water quality in relation to fisheries. So my question would be what kind of water quality or habitat conditions are relevant for striped mullet that we could look at the data and maybe provide an answer through right. this project that's funded. I mean, right. And I don't know the answer to that, but if you've got any ideas, it's awesome. Okay. We do have Dan Zapp here who, we do have Dan Zapp who is actually our, um, one of our two bio leads for Stripe Mullet. So Dan, if you want to jump in and provide, um, you know, your thoughts on this, because you certainly thought about striped mullet fishery and sort of those aspects of it more than I have. Yeah. Well, if, if, if before Dan does that, I think the, I think Nathan is right. And it's an interesting, more general question. And then let's turn to striped mullet as an example. But the way I, I hear the question is how we can frame questions, plural, about individual species 
in terms of this broader system. And for, so, for instance, given the, the life history of each of these things and their habitat associations and or dependencies and the risks to habitat quality values, uh, and as those manifest in terms of productivity or year class production or other kinds of ecological or uh, auto ecological processes and internal species processes. So at, at least we began laying out or correlating the parts of the habitat mosaic and waters that are most likely to be affected or to have an effect on the species we're looking at. You know, so we could take as, as, as Dan gets his answer together, the, the life history of striped mullet and look at where from egg to larva to juvenile to adult to spawning or breeding adult where in the waterscape those animals occur and then what habitat and water quality threats or issues risks or opportunities for improvement might exist in each then i think that we can begin focusing our discussions on really applying the broader suite of things to the, the things that the commission is considering is that fair Nathan before Dan adds I mean that that's that's the way I look at it. Yes. Uh, so this is Dan. Uh, I can I can try to take a, a stab at, at that question. So I'm one of the co-leads for Stripe Mullet. Um so as part of the FMP or uh, amendment two that we're developing for the Stripe Mullet FMP, um we do a review of the the um the life history characteristics of striped mullet and the habitat characteristics that are important for striped mullet. Um, so it's kind of difficult to like pin down like specific habitat variables that are important to the life history of striped mullet because in some ways their well their life history is um, it's pretty diverse I guess to begin with but then in a lot of ways like striped mullet are kind of uh, almost habitat generalists. Uh, you can find them in a lot of different habitats but the long story short, like they, they spawn in the ocean. So their early life history is, is in the ocean and then they grow immature in the estuary, in the estuary. Um, generally where we see striped mullet is more in the upper estuary, um, estuarine areas. So in kind of, uh, more of a, a mid salinity type habitat, um, in years like this year, when salinity has been really high, we've seen them really, really far up the river. Um, up the rivers. Um, so, uh, but when salinity is more uniform throughout the estuary or it's lower, um, we see them, you know, generally like spread out uh, throughout the entire estuary. Um, so I guess generally where we, we think of striped mullet when we're seeing them in the estuary is like back up in, back up in like uh, creeks uh, or up at the heads of rivers. Um, so as we develop amendment two, you know, we'll be putting together like the life history and habitat information that's important. I don't know that we could bring it to your next meeting, um, but like that is definitely something that will be available to this group eventually is a, a more detailed um, overview of the habitat characteristics that are important for striped mullet and the life history as well. And Dan, do we, oh, sorry. Dan, do we have um, do we have this kind of information in the annual FMP updates that we could go ahead and send out to the group? Because uh, I'm thinking, don't we have the research needs for these specific species? Yeah, so we we have um, some of this information is available in the annual FMP updates, um, and actually, the stock assessment that we just completed in 2022 has a pretty detailed. Uh, description of all of the research that's gone into the habitat uh, references for striped mullet and uh, the life history characteristics. So that is actually a really good source of, of some of that information as well. Thank you, Dan. And hey, this is Ann. I was just going to add um, there is information in the 2016 Coastal Habitat Plan, which is our source document about water quality trends in different um, river basins, 
from DWR's monitoring data, as well as in the CHIP, the 2021 amendment, and that water quality data would be in the um, habitat monitoring chapter. So, um, and then later I was going to show you some websites where you could go and just get some information yourself if you want to just peruse, you know, where what's going on in our coastal waters. I think that that's exactly right. It's like what's going on where the fish are. So you have to know we need good fish data to know where they are and when they're there and how long. And then we need our good habitat data and water quality data. So that makes, that's the challenge. Uh, so, Laura Kay, maybe you would, um, would you, maybe this is premature, but remind us since for people that are just getting oriented, what the additional upcoming FMPs are in the schedule so that the kinds of water quality and habitat issues that will be most directly relevant to the ebb and flow of those debates this year and next might be. Is that coming up or do you already, is this, I mean, it's, I think it would help people uh, to know what those are. Yeah, so those are actually in the NFC work plan. Um, and I can resend that out to the group after this meeting. Um, I can I can review it now. I think our um, I believe that our next FMP it's going to be um, of course we're working on striped mullet. Uh, we're also in the process of working on the spotted sea trout FMP, and then oyster clam. Uh, I believe will come after that. And Corinne can jump in and correct me if I've misquoted that. But those three are um, the ones that are coming up. Clam and oyster being, you know, um, the cream of the crop for this group, I think, <laughs> in terms of uh, habitat, certainly. <laughs> Does blue crab That's come in there as well? So or there is going to be there is going to be a blue crab um, stock assessment update, uh, and so uh, depending on the outcome of that. Um, and Corinne, I'll let you talk about this, but there could be blue crab issues coming up after that. Yeah, you pretty much covered it, Laura. Um, the the blue crab, um, we are doing a stock assessment update um, this year, and there is um, adaptive management throughout that plan uh, based on the stock assessment. Um, so it, um, uh, depending on what the stock assessment update has, um, may trigger some of the adaptive management items. Um, and so that would just come about, um, dependent on those results. Um, a lot of that, um, ends up more so going to, um, the, regional and the shellfish crustacean, um, but sometimes with blue crab as well, um, we do look towards um, habitat and water quality um, since uh, our inverts have uh, a lot of troubles due to um, the water quality step. Um, and, but um, yeah, that's, Laura covered the rest of what is um, happening in the um, FMP world. And my reason, Doug, here again, in, in bringing that up is to assure people that uh, pretty much a, that, that the, this year and next will bring to us a, a pretty broad cross section of species that use different parts of our system in different ways. And so issues that are relevant to more marine species that also forage inside their primary and secondary nursery area users or that actually use brackish waters as main adult habitats all are coming to us and then in addition should striped bass come back again as it might under that process pretty much a, uh, there'll be opportunities to think through almost all of the habitat and water quality issues that are relevant and so we just need a, a way to think about that in terms of the ebb and flow of work um, and to be able to focus on things that are most pertinent but but you'll have an opportunity so so as you think personally about how you want to engage with this process, um, please take that into account. 
Um, so on it, I have in the MFC update, which will sort of uh, finish up with this uh, straight mullet discussion. Thank and you. And do you want me to go ahead and get started on that? That sounds great. Thank you so much. Absolutely. This more oh, Pierce. Can I ask a quick question? Absolutely. Um, one thing that comes to you know, is coming about and the water quality and habitat has been decimated about and a lot of people around my area are asking, is there any study in being done on bay scallops? Yeah, they would follow along with oyster and clams, but um, you know, their population has just been destroyed over the past 10, 15 years due to water quality and, and loss of habitat because there is hardly any seagrass left. Are we doing anything with that now? So, Ann, I don't know if you can answer that. I can't answer the. I was just going to say, um, Jeff Dobbs knew about this a study. He's not on right now. There was somebody working on a study with uh, bay scallops, but um, that was a while ago. So, I don't know of anybody specifically, but maybe Joel Fadri might from the IMS lab. Do you, Joel? The scallops have been sort of so patchy that it's hard to do experiments like in real time, but we are having, you know, you'll find a year in a site where the scallop densities will get pretty high. So we've been trying to do stuff to look at both the nature of the, the existing seagrass and what seems to support um, scallops. We've, we've been doing some temperature stuff and we've been doing some predator stuff. Um, uh, and one thing with the seagrass is uh, certain pockets of seagrass have become more patchy. And so we're trying to understand if if patchy seagrass is is not as healthy for the scallops. So we we don't have a smoking gun answer. Um, yeah, and you know, there's there's a little bit of interest in restocking efforts that is primarily, I would say, being spearheaded by people in Virginia that are on the more hatchery side that, that have some interest. But I haven't. I haven't really kept up tightly with have they made any major leaps and bounds there there has been some of that um sort of success in new york um so we we probably need we will probably need to come together and, and take stock of what we currently know and, and would need to know so there's there's interest in their pieces but i don't think there's a like a coherent attack plan uh, that's my sense um, scallops don't take up uh half my time they, they take up a, a bit of my time so it's also possible that there's just a lot more people that are more knowledgeable about the, the gaps than, than me that but that's my two cents and isn't seagrass though one of the priority areas in the recent chip work oh yeah and um we the division now has a monitoring program to determine when scallops can open if they meet a certain threshold trigger um, and it's just been so low. The scallops have been low regardless of the condition of the seagrass, at least at the level that we are monitoring. Um, but this year they opened core sound. I think it was high enough. And I have heard local, um, local information that the scallops in the southern part of the state, as in like Onslow, Pender County, were on an uptick. But then you can go back and then they're not there. And so it could be a predator issue, is what I've heard. Well, yeah. it's. Go ahead. Who's that, Joel? That's Mark Parrish again. Oh, yeah. um, you know, I grew up on Bogue Sound. And I can tell you for a fact, I mean, I've been, I'm 63 years old and I spent my life in, you know, in the sound out here. The seagrass in the sound now is just about a desert. Um, you know, and then being a nursery area for many types of species and everything, you know, that loss of habitat, including striped mullet, you know, has really caused the loss of everything. Um, we don't see scallops, one, because of loss of seagrass, two, because skates have been on an upturn that a predator to them, as well as you know, some clams. But, you know, I think, you know, 
the difference in salinity and acidity has um, caused a lot of that to happen. And, you know, from what I've been watching you know, over the past 40 to 50 years. So that's why I was asking the question because this, you know, scallops are nearly non-existent around here now. I can remember when I was a lot of y'all's age back in college and stuff like that, you know, I made a living going through college scalloping so we get 25 bushels a day. But we try to maintain the grass beds. We couldn't do it now. Um, like you say, Pender County has seen a little uptick in it. They had a you know, a little bit, but then all of a sudden they disappeared because the skates moved in. You can find crushed shells everywhere. So, you know, the end of field has you know affected it. And that you know, the loss of that seagrass also you lose a lot of detritus and, and plankton that you know that really a lot of the species feed upon. Yeah, and I and I to clarify in the grass, Bogue Sound from the mapping that's been done and monitoring has had the highest loss of, right. of the high salinity water bodies. As a as a positive note in my I'm in the southern part of the state in Wilmington Wrightsville Beach and I love to harvest at Masonboro. Um, I see them increasing in population in my small neck of the woods. And of course, I leave them alone or uh, we can't harvest them. But um, I do see them more and more often, which makes me happy. But that's really sad to hear. Uh, and so um, if you'd like, I can put that on our update list for next time, maybe just to look into like, what do we have? Um, Jeff Dobbs, as Ann said, is our um, base scallop expert here at the division. So I can touch base with him and just have an update for you for the next meeting. That'd be great, Laura, if you can make it not just base scallops, but base scallops and seagrass beds together, you know, so that we're looking at the, the habitat species nexus, that I think that would be really useful. Okay. And so we can um, flesh that out more. And, and of course, we're gonna talk more about the um, other items um, that were requested before and also planning for your next meeting. So I think we'll have more conversation maybe about that as well. Um, I'll go ahead and get through the um, MFC update. Um, it's, it should be pretty quick. And then we can also, if there's any comment on the strike mullet supplement document, we'll do that um, at the end. And again, Dan Zapp is here to help facilitate that. Um, all right, so um, for the, um, since your last meeting, so your last meeting was in October. Since then, we had the November MFC uh, business meeting. And I do have um, quite a few updates from that. So. Um, at your October meeting, we were still waiting, uh, although maybe we weren't by your meeting. We were waiting for a new commissioner to join the commission. It was um, Sarah Gardner. She was sworn in at the um, FinFish AC meeting last October. So we are happy to say that at the November meeting, we did have a full complement of commissioners. Um, the uh, At the meeting, the first item that the commission discussed was uh, regarding joint fishing water delineations. And this is a continuation of an issue that began back in 2018, and it's related to the joint rules that are shared by the Marine Fisheries Commission and the Wildlife Resources Commission and um, the boundaries that establish those inland joint coastal waters. Um, so a, a memorandum of agreement was prepared over the summer by MFC and WRC staff, and that was at the request of both the MFC and the WRC chairman. And that was an effort to try to just make any progress on this issue. Um, like I said, it's been um, ongoing since 2018. So um, the MFC did not uh, take action on the MOA, but they did request that DMF staff continue to reach out to the WRC staff and work towards recommending a plan for how to move forward uh, to address the issue. Um, the commission approved the full slate of nominees for the obligatory seat for the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council. Those nominations uh, will now go to the governor's boards and commission office for consideration. And the uh, nominees were Mike Blanton, Jess Hawkins, Thomas Newman, and Robert Rule. 
Um, the commission gave final approval on amendment two of the estuarine striped bass FMP. This included maintaining the gillnet closure in the Noose and Tarpan River systems until 2024, at which time the division will evaluate the effectiveness of the harvest moratorium and the gillnet closures that have been in place there. Um, I, I, at the October meeting, we talked a little bit about how Amendment 2 um, was the conversation around Amendment 2 is really dominated by these gillnet closure discussions. Um, but there were some other um, really good uh, management that was um, that's now being implemented by the division and the Wildlife Resources Commission. Um, let's see, the commission also gave approval of the goals and objectives for development of Amendment 2 of the Strike Mullet FMP. So, um, Amendment 2 is currently in development. Um, however, the commission uh, also approved development of a supplement. A supplement is basically a, a way to implement some kind of management quickly to address overfishing um, in a fishery. So, for Strike Mullet, uh, the Commission approved option two for supplement A to amendment one of the strike mullet FMP. And that supplement, as I said, is now out for public comment. And um, just a reminder that option two uh, was a November 7th through December 31st closure. That's the end of the year closure, which is estimated to result in a 22.1% reduction. So, if you'll remember back in October, the strike mullet leads um, spoke to you about the scoping period that was um, occurring for Amendment 2. Um, but we do have them uh, here with us tonight. And we don't have a specific presentation. Um, like I said, the supplement is out for public comment. And we just wanted to give you, the committee, um, an opportunity to ask staff questions or give us feedback on that. Um, on that option two of the supplement. Um, and just to wrap up, so the next commission meeting is scheduled for February 22nd through the 24th, and it's gonna be held in New Bern at the Doubletree. Um, and at that meeting, the commission is gonna hear uh, a presentation on false albacore. This is an information paper that was requested by the commission um, just to look at uh, potential management uh, options for that species. Um, we're going to hear the spotted sea trout fishery overview and discuss um, the upcoming scoping period for that FMP. Um, the blue crab fishery management plan amendment three revision. This is actually a revision that is uh, it, it's under the adaptive management for amendment three and it's just an update to the um, the diamondback terrapin. Um, reduction devices that are for, that can be used in crab pots in the diamondback terrapin management areas. Um, and the division, that, that's not a, the division uh, just does the revision as part of the uh, management that was put in place by the commission. So the commission will get an update on that, but there's no action specifically for that item. Um, for striped mullet, uh, we're gonna hear again the outcome of the public review period, including any comments that the committees provide, um, and the commission will be voting on final approval of that supplement. And then finally, we had a couple of rulemaking items. Um, there is a rule that is, uh, will be going for a vote on final approval that deals with um, marinas and shellfish. Um, that one is, uh, effectively putting us into compliance with FDA standards. So that's an item that um, is going to be on the agenda. And also the mutilated finfish rule has been amended and that is going to be up for a final approval vote. Um, okay, and with that, uh, like I said, Dan is here. So if anyone has questions or comments uh, on any of the information that I just read, but specifically if there are any comments anyone would like to provide on the striped mullet supplement, now is a good time to do that. Dan, it's Mark Parrish again. Um, the option number two, which, you know, setting the season closure from November 7th through December, was that based upon 
the spawning season or where was that um, brought about? Yeah, so that was based on a couple of things. Uh, so the impetus for having the closure at the end of the year was based on the spawning season. Um, so the fish are moving into the ocean during that period to spawn. Um, they become more vulnerable to the fishery while they're moving and while they're schooled up. Um, that's also the period of historically when the highest landings occur. Most of the striped mullet landings historically they occur in October and November. Um, and more specifically, they occur, occur about October 15th through November 15th. Um, so targeting the season closure uh, during this period of time was really the only realistic way we could get any type of reduction in the commercial landings. And it also made sense based on the life history of the species. Well, as you are probably aware now, I mean, because striped mullet is very important in my area and a lot of the people I know and everything are question about it. And there were a lot of the ones who would attended the meetings and uh, voice their opinions and all. Um, the one thing that's really, I think, affecting this situation more than anything, you know, was the striped mullet <clears throat> was pretty much a localized, well, I should say the striped mullet row was a pretty localized, you know, delicacy around here. It has now become international and you know, all of a sudden the price of mullet row has gone you know, through the roof. So it's been to be a targeted situation. Um, so when you target a species, particularly for its row, you know, you really, you know, really push that species to extinction. Um, so I'm glad to hear that's what it was. You know, most of the fish you know, understand that they can't continue to target, but they're going to, you know, and that leaves a little bit of that preseason, you know, the tail end before the closure to get some, you know, to keep the market and everything and keep it commercially viable, but also to let them get to the ocean so they can spawn to keep maintain the stock. So uh, thank you. That's, that's, that was my biggest concern. I can go back to people and tell them that's why we're doing it. Not, not just arbitrarily cutting something off just because to say so, because that's where most commercial fishermen think that have a problem with us that, um, that the commission is not thinking about them. They're just, you know, and yeah, you know, of course, always when something gets cut off, if it targets another species, um which brings it to the back on the table you know you know the thing has happened with trigger fish for me and snapper several other you know, species so, mark it's really you. it's really great to hear you say that that is comforting for our decisions that we've made most recently well and that's you know there has been a a hard boundary between the cca and the commercial fishery association and i kind of i've been in both I've owned a commercial license now for over 40 years. Um, the thing I keep putting to both is, this is not a he, she, or whatever, you know, each other person. This has got to be something that has to be done together. Because if they don't maintain their stocks, they keep overfishing it, then there's nothing going to be here for our children. Um, you know, the, the spot situation. Spots used to be so plentiful. People came from everywhere. It was a big, big source of income here in our county because people come here to go spot fishing, but it killed the species. So we've got to put limitations on it to get our stocks back in order. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I'm glad you're on board. Um, I don't know if I might, I see, I think we've got a hand from uh, Mark Sonder as well. Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. And thank you for that broad overview. Uh, you had mentioned gill nets. And I think when it comes even to illegal or unmarked gill nets that can not only affect the striped mullets, but everything. Um, and for conservation and science purposes, uh, I would like, I believe that the contents of these nets should be documented 
insofar as what contents are in them. And I'm not sure why people are not allowed to take photos of what's in them or to just go through them to let the public know, because I think this would be a great knowledge base of, of the exact contents in these gill nets. So, Dan, do you want to talk a little bit about that or um, <clears throat> Steve Poland, you could just talk a little bit about how we monitor gill nets and the research that we do um, to look at just what Mark was talking about. Yeah, I can I can start and then if Steve wants to jump in or, or anybody else wants to jump in, that would be great. Um, so, yes, like we do, um, we do have an interest in in what the what is being caught and what is being harvested in the gillnet fishery. Um, in terms of what's being harvested, that's all reported by by the commercial uh, by the commercial fishermen uh, on the trip tickets um, and a lot of what they do catch is harvested, um, but because of regulations on certain species and some species just aren't targeted. Um, there is, there are species or, or fish that are discarded from those nets. Um, and so there is a law or a rule in place that prohibits the public from interfering with any commercial fishing gear. Like they can't disrupt the way it's fishing, um, gill nets, crab pots, whatever it might be. Um, and that's a, you know, that's a, um, that's a long, as far as I know, it's a long standing rule. We do have a, a board observer program where we send our staff out onto boats with commercial gill netters um, and they observe and record and document what is everything that's caught in the net. So everything that's harvested, everything that's thrown back, um, any protected species interactions. Uh, this observer program, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't go on every trip, but it does go on a percentage of trips. Um, and it's statewide, uh, so it allows us to get a good characterization of um, what what is being caught in different areas of the state at different times of year. And if I left anything out there, uh, Steve or anybody else can feel free to jump in. Um, Mark Sondi here again. I wasn't speaking about disrupting uh, uh, anybody's nets, uh, but just to know what's in them. And I, I think that would be important. For instance, before we were talking about the bay scallops, but we put those in conjunction with seagrass. So uh, because it's a whole ecosystem, should there be a illegal slash unmarked gill net, it would be wonderful to know from a science perspective and conservation perspective, what's in there, whether alive or, or, or dead, you know, what what's what's being captured and what most likely is dead at that point. Uh, that that was my point. Well, that was my question, really, um, not to disrupt any commercial fishermen's property or or to take anything from there but ones that are just floating illegally unmarked. Um, why is it so that we cannot know the contents? So um, any, uh, I can I can touch on that. So we do actually have a Marine Patrol officer here. <laughs> he said, um, if you see any unmarked or illegal gill nets, certainly call Marine Patrol and they will come out um and inspect those nets and, and if they are illegally fishing they can deal with that um and and that is the case across the state yeah i think in all states but if they're discarded and therefore then unmarked uh you don't know who they belong to and when marine fisheries does get the call uh they're told the people are told not to touch it not to photograph it, not to do anything, and they'll take care of it, but you never know what was in there. Just a thought. So we get pictures all the time of Gilnet sent to us, hey, Gilnet in such and such creek. Uh -huh. There's nothing that says they can't. 
they just can't pick it up because they're not licensed to do so. So okay. it'd be like they will fit if we came up on the public and they're pulling a gill net in, it may have come an issue of, well, are you fishing the gill net or, you know, so it's a licensing issue with the public picking up. Did you hear that, Mark? I don't, I don't know if you were able to hear um, the officer. I think you're muted, Mark. I'm sorry. The gentleman was very soft and, uh, yeah, and so hard to he said, he said, there's no law that you can't take a picture. So certainly um, they said they actually, a lot of the contacts they have are people sending them texts with a picture of the gill net and that's how they go look at it. Um, he did say that you're not um, supposed to pick it up because it can be an issue of if you're not licensed to fish a gill net and they come upon you with the gill net, that can be a problem. Okay, well, that's um, yep. already different news and I'm, I'm glad to know that when marine fisheries does go through it um will they is there a way to know what was in it and how many of what was in it uh, in that net do we document it might it depend it might be documented in the instant report it just depends i mean a lot of times if i get there and it's not really it depends on when the net's found. Like summertime, you might find more species. It's not like, for instance, when we just fished one, or not fished, we pulled it off of the pier the other day. It, had, it wasn't abandoned. I think it just got lost in the currents and they couldn't retrieve it. So we wound up getting some of it on another day and just had man hating in it. So I documented on my instant report, maybe that, you know, there's as many man hating or, or not necessarily a number, but you yeah. know, estimated. Yeah. So he said that. depends on the. It's also doing reports or something like that. It's not. So it is it is documented in the uh, Marine Patrol incident report when they catch that net, depending on what the state of the net is and things like that. Okay. Thank you to the yep. both of you. Didn't mean to take up all that time on gill nets, but I thank you. Absolutely. And Mark, if you have more questions. You are welcome to call me and we can chat more. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's what our purpose is. So definitely give me a call if, you, if anything else comes up. Thank you very much. And this is uh, Laura again or Paula? This is Laura, but okay. you can call either one of us. <laughs> yeah, because I see I see Paula's name on my screen, but I didn't see yours. And, yes. Okay. Laura Kay. Very good. Thank you, Laura Kay. Absolutely. Do we have anything else on our agenda for the evening? I, I, I do not have it on the one I have. The only thing uh, we have public comment. Uh, we don't have yes. anyone here. Did we have any sign up? So we have, we do not have any public comment signed up. And then planning for our next meeting. Yes. So. Um, Ann Deaton actually has the update um, that she's going to provide, uh, and that's based on the um, items that we discussed at your last meeting. Yeah, sure, and I can go over that now. And then after you hear about, I'm going to provide updates on some of the questions that were asked at the last meeting. And then if there's um, other things we want to, we need to add to the list, we can do that. So let me just, I'm going to sh share my screen. Hang on. Mm -hmm. Share. Okay. You see that? Title page? Uh, not yet, Anne. Oh, oh here it comes. Yay. Yes. Got it. Okay. So um, just have a few slides to just make it easier to follow. <clears throat> okay. So at the last meeting, um, Doug and Anna had talked about, they raised some questions on 
things they'd like to get some updates on, one of which we were just discussing, the striped mullet and what habitat more quality actions could be impacting it. Um, but some of the others were just general updates on chip implementation and different habitat initiatives. And um, it was requested that I give a, just a brief update on each of these meetings. So I've decided I'm gonna call them habitat happenings. Um, so Bob Christian, who is no longer on the advisory committee because he, he's moving to Florida, but um, at the last meeting he was here and he asked for an update on the water quality summit, which had just happened. And so just briefly, I included a summary in the media materials for you, but that was held um, together with CHIP folks as well as Pew and Coastal Federation staff to sort of a kickoff to form a public-private stake, um, public-private partnership. And that was a recommendation in the CHIP. And the idea is to get um, more engagement with various stakeholders and support and have them, you know, actively participating and getting some actions done that um, the staff can't get to or, um, it just really falls out of what they can do. So we had over a hundred people there and it kind of flowed with first, you know, what is the problem? And Mike Blanton spoke and he did a great job explaining about declining fish and the, the um, loss of seagrass in Elmer Sound, um, algal blooms. There was a farmer from Madame Mesquite who also, um, he talked about how sea level rise is impacting their farms and runoff and a really novel project that they did up in Madame Mesquite area to divert water that was coming off the farms and now, you know, is going to some abandoned farmland. So instead of draining into Pamlico Sound um, or Alligator River, it's going into this area. So it was a positive note that things can be done to make things better but we need new ideas and we need to bring more people to the table. And then we also had the mayor of Beaufort there, um, Sharon, Har Sharon Harker, who spoke to you know, the, the flooding that is happening more and more in Beaufort and the need to protect not just that community, but um, um, social justice because, you know, that, so that, there's not a uh, disenfranchising to the, the lower income folks in that area. And then they then we had um, seagrass experts go over what the problem is, what we do know about seagrass and its current change in distribution and condition, and why the approach that was in the recommendations of the CHIP will help. And those are to develop water clarity standards, which I think I mentioned last time. Um, so Division of Water Resources is working on that. And they went over that. And so the, the outcome of that was we wanted to get these people to sort of sign up to continue as a stakeholder group. And we have two uh, stakeholder groups now formed. So one is called Working Lands and Waters. And so these are farmers, fishermen, um, aquaculture, um, aquaculturists, shellfish, police guys, as well as anybody could be in that group. But that's where the focus is to work on those type of issues. And they've met once, they met in uh, December and they already have a big plan. They've got some movers and shakers in that group. Um, so you'll be hearing about this probably at the Marine Fishery Commission, but they're drafting a resolution that they want to send to the General Assembly. And once they have a draft, they're gonna send it to the CHIP Steering Committee. And from there, the process is it would go to the full commissions to, make, to see if they can get them to support the resolution as well. So what they wanna do is send this resolution and this is really focused on farmland and the need for more cost share BMP money because North Carolina compared to other states 
is very low amounts of money coming at the state level. They do get federal funding for some of these programs, but um, the state funding is really lacking and there's definitely more demand than there is funds. So the resolution is going to be focused on that, getting more money, especially to the coast and focusing on nature-based um, methods to control runoff, which is the number one cause of water pollution, especially the water clarity declining for the seagrass. So the other group is um, a coastal community and ecosystem resilience work group. They haven't met, they're formed, but they're gonna be meeting soon. And so we'll see um, what they come up with. So some of these, for example, that resolution was discussed at the meeting in the breakout groups. And so they'll probably focus on the need for um, doing something about more nature-based stormwater strategies, but more of a, more at the town level. So the, I was in a, a work, a breakout for that, and it was a lot of municipalities and county folk who wanted to, you know, learn how they can improve water quality and, and how they can do that in a nature-friendly way to protect their economy. So lots of people out there do understand that in the coast, that's our economy, you know, coastal tourism is also based on going out fishing, shellfishing in safe water that where you can eat it and all that. So that's where it stands. And I think that they, it is not too late. If you or anyone else wants to be involved, um, I, they can contact me and I will, um, I will get you the, the information, the um, coordinator for that effort. So we're hoping that um, has some really good outcomes. Uh, the other update, the Nutrient Criteria Development Plan, um, the DW, Division of War Resource Staff, meet uh, every twice a, week, twice a month. And, um, and then they meet with their science, their SAC, Sci Scientific Advisory Council. They had a meeting planned for actually tomorrow, but it's been postponed due to a staff person being out. But since we met last, they have draft language prepared for a water clarity standard, which is great. And they also have a white paper justifying it that members on their SAC wrote because the division wanted the SAC members to actually write that. So now they might, they're gonna have to meet one more time to clean things up and then it would go to a stakeholder work group, which the division of water resources will form for um, they give them a chance to have input before it goes to the EMC for them to approve. So we were thinking last year that it would be this first quarter that it would go to the EMC, but that's not the case. So it's going slower than we thought, but by the end of this year, I think they will have that in place. And that is going to be applied to any water bodies that have SAV currently or historically. So they're going to be using the maps that are in the chip and that's broken into regions. And if there's seagrass there, then there'll be a water clarity standard. And once you have a water clarity standard, you will address that by looking at nutrient limitations and sediment limitations. So it is thought that especially in Elmore Sound, that'll be mostly non-point runoff rather than point sources like wastewater discharges. So we're um, looking forward to that. And also since the last meeting, we, we, um, we held a wetland mapping call with any, any folks, agencies, NGOs, universities that have voiced the need for updated wetlands in the coast. And we heard that a lot when we were developing the wetland paper for the chip update. And um, we had everybody, we're just trying to fine tune like what do you, what does your agency really need? Because 
people have different goals based on their authorities. And then we had experts in remote sensing there and mapping to explain what their products could do. And so we're gonna have a follow-up meeting, um, hopefully February and um, talk about funding and, and, and if these people are interested in, in being a, a long-term work group to get this done. So, you know, our most recent wetland maps that cover our whole coast at one time period are from the 90s. So they're really old. And there's some newer maps and those are included in the, in the CHIP update, but they are from NOAA's CCAP program and the resolution isn't as good as it could be. It's like 30 meters resolution but they can now do one meter. So if you can get a map that can show you what's there in one meter, you can do a lot of analysis, you know, and change and see where you're losing marsh or gaining marsh or forested wetlands and such. So we've also been working on the shellfish mapping program. I think I mentioned that they did a pilot project the last year or so. Um, so they finished, they finished that and um, we're just kind of revising the method a bit so that we hope to get where they'll be going to sentinel sites throughout the coast, focusing on intertidal oyster reefs, and they map those and then with the drone, then they go back and sample. And then the next year they'll go to five other sentinel sites and then they'll rotate. So they don't need to go to each site every year, but that way we can cover more ground, but get back to it in a fairly quick time. Um, I think I mentioned we had a CHIP steering committee meeting in December, which we just kind of gave them an update on everything that's going on. And I wanted to bring to your attention that APNEP, Almore Pamlico National Estuary Partnership, is in the process of updating their management plan called the Comprehensive Conservation Management Plan. So CCMP, and they plan to have that updated sometime mid to end of this year. And Doug Rader used to oversee that program. Um, another update, so also in your handout, I gave you a sample of what we have. We have a spreadsheet. I know that's hard to read. Um, of, of the list of actions that were in FMPs. And we just started out with the most recent plan for each species. So in our table here, we've got some columns hidden too, but it'll tell you what the last, what year the most recent plan was, which for this one was 2017, when it's due to come up again. So that would help guide you for when you wanna be in anticipation of an FMP, so 2023. Um, what the action says, and then there are um, progress updates there. And I think those were done by lead fishery management staff. It, um, but I've noticed some of them could be updated more. So um, what we'd like to do before we gave you everything is, is get these fine tuned and make sure we can update them where we can, and then you tell me what you want to do. So if you had a spreadsheet, back the Excel sheet, you could filter it, sort it. Uh, you guys would could re review um, a fishery, you know, one species FMP at a meeting and maybe prioritize anything that is not accomplished yet or look and see if you see any gaps of things you need. So it'll be kind of a guide for you all in the future. Okay, so we talked last time about getting more information about fish kills and algal, algal blooms and whether they were getting worse or better. Um, so as I mentioned, I think earlier, there is information in the 2016 chip and in the 2021 20, amendment, but this is a, just a very cool tool that any of you can go to. And that's the link at the bottom. And, I can send that to you later if you're interested, but it's from Division of War Resources 
it's a map of the whole coast. Um, and what you do is you can zoom into where you're interested. You can, and then you click. So that's a fish there. The magenta is a, that's a fish. That's um, algal bloom. And when you click on it, so this is just a screenshot. So I clicked on that fish right there. This block comes up and further down, it told you what kind of species it was. And then you could click on that picture. And if they took a, a photo when they were there, doing the investigation, you'll see it, get an idea of what it looked like. So that's striped bass. It was striped bass and catfish that they reported in that one. But then you can also go backwards and you can get individual reports by year. And in those, they have all the, the species, but it is in a, a paragraph format. So I scanned, I skimmed some. I didn't see striped mullet listed, I don't think, in in, in any, but I was going to get in touch with their um, staff that does this and see if they can, I'm sure they have a database and see if we can get a query on where, if you wanted, uh, where straight mullet fish kills have been reported. And this is only what, you know, where they've been reported and when. So I can work on that for you if you're interested. And let's see, another website that Nathan Hall knows all about is ModMon. And ModMon has a lot of information about water quality, but it, it is specific really to Noose River because they have stations up and down that river. Um, not only is there information about um, water quality conditions, but there's data, there's a list of publications, so you could, you know, look up a publication. And you can also, they, they post these updates. Um, oh, Nathan might have to help me here. I don't know how often, this says December 14th, and it was the most recent one that was on their website today. But if you yeah, look- Yeah, they just went out last week and I haven't uh, gotten the data yet, so. Is it every month you put one or every, it's every month during the winter and every two weeks from March through November. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, I mean, it can be used as an indicator of how stressed out our estuaries are, right? Even if it's going to vary. Yeah. And just for, this is an interesting figure you got showing right now, just because you're talking about salinity earlier, it is yeah. salty out there. The the left side of this figure is uh, about 15 kilometers upstream of Newburn, like at where Warehouser plant is. This side, you know, yeah, it's just near the Streets Ferry, which is near Warehouser. Yeah. yeah, it's right there at Warehouser. And you went like six feet down and the salinity was 14 or 13 and a half. The saltiest okay. we've ever seen anyway. This is salinity bar. Yep. So this is you move downstream, and there's your you salinity. Upstream, and anyway, mm -hmm. it's just really salty. Yeah. The saltiest we've ever seen since really? Bodmon started in '94. So what, I didn't what look through the space records. Yeah, you've got 12 at the bottom. Uh, it's it was 13 and a half. 13 and a half. Yep. And it's then hard to you, see the colors, but you can see Do you know. Right. Yeah. It's very saturated. Yeah. If you uh, had any blue, there's you'd have some concerns. There's no blue there, so it's really good. It's winter, yep. of course. So, yeah. And then you have your chlorophyll A as an indicator of algae and your turbidity. So blue is good. Red is bad. Right. If there's a bad and a good. Anyway, I think it's pretty cool, and I think that. Um, this committee might be interested in a presentation at some point, Nathan, and we could talk about that later. Sure. Sort of on trends overall, you know, more. So that that was it for updates. Um, we talked about straight mullet 
And I was going to say, we'll, we're going to get that to you as we get closer into the amendment. Um, there were some other, you know, I didn't show you all the habitat, the habitat more quality recommendations from FMPs, but um, you'll just have to let me know if you want the whole big list. I just didn't want to overwhelm you at first. Um, Doug had asked about updates on South Atlantic Fisher Management Council work. And before you go on, uh, since you took my name in vain anyway, I'll use it as an opportunity to talk about the community thing. I, I, I'm actually in love with your your spreadsheet, and because I think it would really help us as things move forward to put things together through these kinds of lenses. I mean, we see the world piecemeal is the way the division has to deal with things, and to have it as a living, breathing thing that we can uh, supplement and bring in your the research recommendations as they come together and just sort of use as a, a framework on which things can be hung. And then as the FMP cycle through, then we can even begin to show progress and identify understanding of the issues that are most important and and and, and on. So I, I know it takes a lot of time to extract those things and keep them up to date, but I, I for one, I think I expect the whole committee would be grateful to you for that way. Obviously, you know, as you are able to get it together, that's great. And don't have it's it's just one of those things that because of staff limitations, you don't have time to do the follow up and see how things are going. But it's in everybody's the back of their head that they have I, to work on things. I, I know it is, and we're and we're grateful okay. for what you've already done. And I think as as we can together amplify that, I think it'll be really fabulous. So thank you very much for that. You're welcome. All right. So this is the page of things we haven't done yet. So we don't really want to focus on that. But we will get to them, um, I mean, and we can add to this list. Um, all I had, I mean, we do have some information on shellfish and water quality trends that we could probably get like shellfish sanitation to present. So maybe since I called for it last time, uh, I'll mention the, uh, the climate vulnerability assessments piece and generalize that for the committee. Not, many of us are concerned about how we understand the way that the um, systems that we're supposed to be giving advice on are changing both directionally with climate and other forcers and also the variability and changes they're in, inclu in including the uh, prevalence of intense storms and uh, intense droughts and all those kinds of things. And so how the system is changing. And that's, I think across the board as we Again, this journey together will be looking. I think it'll be incumbent on us to look more and more at what we know and don't know about how those changing the changes in the system are going to be affecting water quality issues, what will flow issues, water quality issues, habitat issues, the suitability for life history stages of the managed species, and whether how those affect recruitment, likelihood, and year class development, and all the direct fisheries management outcomes there. So. Um, anyway, I, just as a personal matter, I'm going to keep that in the back of my head. And as we go through all these things, I'll be thinking, I wonder how how stable that interpretation is and what else don't we know about what the future will hold? If I can underscore that, that'd be great. Well, we might be able to get, get somebody from NOAA to give a presentation, or I do have a, a PowerPoint, you know, slides you know, PDF slides that were given at, at a Habitat AP meeting. It just, they just you, haven't finalized you, the report. You guys, you guys should decide what the best way to brief us on the status yeah. information about uh, coastwide and localized changes in, in coastal and marine systems are, are being better understood. So the Atlantic coastwide process that the councils and commissions are collaborating on and just so we're up to date with what more we should expect to be known by the processes that are underway. But you should decide what the best way to keep us up to date on that might be. Okay, will do. And I want to compliment you on all your hard work. Thank you so much for all of that. Oh, you're welcome. It wasn't that hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
All right. Uh, I bet I bet members might have other ideas about things that haven't surfaced. And I wonder, Anna, if you're willing to allow other committee members to hold forth on issues that they haven't heard about just so that we can grab them into a perspective list for consideration later. Absolutely. We heard a few tonight already. The base gallop was one, I recall. Do we have any other questions for Ann at all? You know, there is a similar uh, calico scallop question too in the offshore waters, where that's another one of these species that comes and goes. And in my memory, uh, the, that calico scallop and what was it, a uh, rock shrimp FMP, I think they've only been like two years, haven't there? When uh, calico scallops were being harvested offshore, and, and I and, and that's probably in thirty years or forty years, and and I just don't don't know this the, the patchiness question is really interesting. And I do think my memory, and again, I'm probably out of date, but my memory is that when Pete Peterson was alive and still publishing papers on bay scallops back in the early aughts, that he really he recognized the direct. Um, relationship back to cow nose ray populations and herds and uh, habitat concentrations since they were concentrating on the highest value habitats and nearly wiping them out in Bogue Sound and other places so and those kinds of things and, but it does seem like that there was a recommendation about getting scallops to a certain age class uh, and once you could do that avoid more localized predation that you could actually possibly jump start some of the population. So I think there's more to know about um, seagrass bed dynamics and interactions among species. Yeah, they're very vulnerable too because they're just like sitting ducks out there for anything that wants to eat them. Even though they can jump, they can jump, swim a little. I just wanted mention one thing you know we're talking about like climate change and changes in river flow patterns and that kind of stuff and one thing i've always been curious about i've never seen really any data on but i think could gre greatly influence all of our estuarine systems is changes in inlet dynamics i mean particularly for you know 90 percent of our estuaries are behind the outer banks with only a few little tiny pinholes that separate them from the ocean. And yeah, I just be really interested to know what is known about how greater exchange with the ocean could affect all of these fisheries and habitats. And yeah, you know, yeah. I certainly don't know much about it, but I just can imagine that it could be pretty big. Stan Riggs, when he was still active, did some really yeah. interesting work. I know you know Nathan, and in fact, we when I used to work for EDF, we helped we helped pay for that very large project, looking at um, generally prognosticating about the, the um, likelihood of stability of out, the outer banks and uh, rising inlets. And it it just reminds me that you know we all take for granted the fact that the old uh, Roanoke Inlets up to the north uh, re will remain sealed, and that Admiral Sound will remain a mostly, you know, oligohaline system. And there's absolutely no reason to expect that to be the case with rising seas and more intensifying storms. And it, it wouldn't be slow directional responses. It would be light switch if you get the wrong storm or the right storm, depending on how you look at it, rebuilding some of those oceanic connections up there. But so I, I don't know who's taken up the mantle of work on inlet and barrier island dynamics in North Carolina. If you may, but um, it'd be great to have some. If anyone, maybe we could, and maybe we could enlist someone to come brief us on the changing geology of the coast and what is on people's minds about research priorities there now. That'd be fabulous. I'd love to hear that. Yeah, maybe Reed Corbett is is I'm not sure, but um. Dan Riggs, I think he was the one that did the maps that showed the change expected in, in the Outer Banks. And NOAA's um, latest sea level rise um, models, you could look at that and see how 
those inlets are going to change. But I, I think that climate vulnerability assessment even goes into that a bit, how the salinity will change and, and all that, <clears throat> how it affects species. We'll be in bay, um, we'll have bays, not sounds. I got um, just, I think, something that that uh, we haven't really talked about in, during this this uh, meeting at all. Um, something I, I'd like to see if we could get it on DMF's radar is has to do with um, waterfront development and habitat. So, um, you know, I recently built a dock. I went through the whole camera process. I did all that stuff. Um, and in the end of it, you know, ultimately for my Two hundred dollar or one hundred and sixty dollar permit. I can encroach on the public waterway, put my dock in, pressure treated pilings, plastic, whatever I want to put in there, as long as it meets the scope of my permit. Um, and so I watch other. You know, that's pretty. That's a great bargain for someone who can afford waterfront property. Um, there's no mitigating strategies right now for I encroach into the public trust. Um, I build my dock or my subdivision or development, whatever it is, um, to do any sort of mitigation strategy as far as requirement to put in living shoreline or so many square feet of oyster reef or something to, or seagrass even. There's nothing to make it so where my heavy equipment came in and trampled down all my seagrass to build my pier. There is no requirement currently for me to build or rebuild what was destroyed. Um, I did a, a project through Coastal Fed where I went out and recovered marine debris post uh, Hurricane Florence from all the cut banks and all the docks that we we build will eventually fall down. Heavy storms make them fall down faster and that further goes on to damage the ecosystem. So I, I would just like to see if we could and, and to add on to that, I am not allowed because I'm in a primary nursery area in a you know, semi closed area. I'm not allowed to put oysters legally under my dock for the purposes of clarifying cleaning the waterway. And that is ludicrous to think about that here I'm I'm doing something that is damaging to the waterway and I'm not allowed to do anything to mitigate my damage. And I think that that is something that um, should be on the radar as we're looking into pretty much, you know, the waterfront premium Waterfront properties that have not been built on yet are becoming fewer and fewer, but there are still some great parcels of land, especially in the down east community. Um, it won't take long for Florida to move up here and do what they did down there. So I just think we should be looking at some mitigating strategies towards development as we're developing on the water. So that, that's kind of my, it's not really a question, it's more of a comment and uh, just a view. Thank you. Thank you. That is really fabulous, Scott. And if I can sort of blast from the past, as one of the authors, I should say that or not, but one of the people who helped write that the that part of the Marine Fisheries Reform Act, uh, those of us that came up with that Coastal Habitat Protection Plan idea, um, originally hoped that it would lead to goals being set for habitat restoration for each category with the idea that you would look at what the system-wide needs would be for each type and where you stood relative to that and where there were losses that were accountable that that could put in place mitigation programs that were avoidance and uh, and, and relating and then ultimately leading the offset and progress towards those goals. But I, not not much of has happened along those lines. I, I mean, there's a lot in the wetland game to learn from about how you do that kind of no net loss program or net improvement program. But it would be fun to through this over the next couple of years to choose one of one of these habitats that we feel are very much um, at risk and where there might be mitigating strategies that could begin building some at least some pilot offset programs. And uh, the one you suggest might be fun to play with because it's people with money by definition. You can take an account of shading of habitats and direct losses and indirect effects through chemistry and other things and look at how you might build a maybe a voluntary offset program to begin with so that individual people like you didn't have to come up with those strategies on your own. 
but had a, a program to pay into it for well-meaning planners. I don't know, I'm just playing. But the idea, is, there's nothing in the idea behind the Coastal Habitat Protection Plan that prevents that eventuality. We would just have to begin taking steps in that direction. Thank you. Do we have any other comments or questions this evening? Um, Mark Sonder here again. Um, Anne was talking about coastal habitat protection um, and in the, uh, also mm -hmm. about the nutrient development plan. I think it's been well documented, even though I, I didn't hear you speak about it, uh, about the hog farms um, upstream of our coast uh, and their farm stock ponds, even in a medium rain, uh, overflowing the reservoirs. Of course, that goes directly into just overflow on their land, into the brooks, into the streams, into the sound, bays, and of course, the ocean. Um, how much do we, does marine fisheries, have a say in what these hog farms are doing to our waterways um, as they are obviously not filtering out the the quote unquote pollution which is just a byproduct of having hog farms and how can we hold back those reservoir ponds from overflowing. I mean, I guess we all know the reason why, and I guess uh, politically they're, they're, they're well placed, but can marine fisheries, is, is there any power and authority to put something forward regarding these hog farms? And, and again, it's been well documented what they've been doing uh, and how it's affected the nutrients, especially as it pertains to aquatic species? Um, well, one thing I'll say is after Floyd, Hurricane Floyd, they put in a moratorium on new hog farms in floodplains, new ones. And then the existing ones are still there and are a problem. And then there, were, and there's a buy, there was a buyout program and they bought out a lot, but there were even more still there. You know, they're still there. So it's an ongoing problem, but um, I think the process would be um, for, so those are regulated by EMC, I believe, the Environmental Management Commission, because of the discharge, not supposed to be a discharge, but um, they do do um, compliance checks. They have staff that goes out and inspects the hog lagoons. And um, I, I mean, the process would be you all could write a letter or refer it to the chip steering committee to discuss and and write a letter to somebody. <clears throat> I think also not, I think Lisa Ryder, through her organization, they've done a bit on um, hog farms and maybe she would have more to to weigh in on. But yeah, Marine Fishery Commission doesn't have any direct authority over hot farms. But through the ship and having those other agencies and commissions involved, that's where we could work on something. Haven't I'm sorry. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm speaking out of turn. I'll wait. <laughs> um, haven't many letters been written already and even lawsuits been invoked over uh, over quite a number of years, um, and um, yet the problem, the same problem, still uh, exists. And I, I yield the floor to uh, to Lisa, who probably will have more information on that. So I beg your pardon for interrupting you, Lisa. Oh no, no worries. Um, if it's okay to speak, um, we have some 
pretty extensive, you know, through our coalition and certainly in our organization through the White Oak River Basin, we have pretty extensive data on the impacts of CAFOs um, or concentrated animal feeding operations in addition to industrial agriculture impacts to water quality and habitat loss. Um, we actually went through um, over a year long um, program that included both several folks actually from the Marine Food Commission and other, I'm sure that were folks from other advisory committees who participated in this as an as our industry working group. And we included both the recreational and commercial fisher folks in this process because the initial assessment that we did included a survey that went out to folks who fish at the coast. The very first question of this electronic survey was, do you fish at the coast of North Carolina? If you said yes, you got to participate. If you said no, sorry, we did not collect your input. And this survey identified that the number one water quality concern amongst those who fish on the coast of North Carolina is industrialized agriculture and factory farming. So yes, it is on folks' mind. Yes, it is an issue. And it's been researched to death. So there's no question that there are impacts. Um, but right now it's really, you know, boots on the ground advocacy. So there are organizations like ours and coalitions like ours, including Waterkeeper uh, Carolina, that have put together legislative agendas relative to this issue. So if um, the folks within the committee wanted to make recommendations to the commission to push this forward, like Ann said, um, to other folks who are making these decisions or, or pushing these decisions to the uh, General Assembly or the legislator, um, that would go a long way. And certainly we felt like that you know, another benefit for including both the commercial and the recreational fisheries uh, folks is that with the lobbying power of these two groups, there could be significant change um, come about. But yes, Anne's right. I mean, there is a moratorium, but that doesn't mean that the, the farms that are still there are causing problems. We do flyovers, uh, aerial observations on a regular basis, and we catch violations that no one in the state is catching. And, and do they get punished? Is there any, uh, besides a slap on the hand, do, is there any punitive damages uh, when you're proven, when you do these flyovers, that they're going against the law? Not to take up too much time, but the short of it is that um, much like those that develop illegally um, or with outside of their permit or, you know, what they can do, um, it's usually, uh, we're going to give you 30 days, we're going to give you 60 days, and we all know how many times it can rain or, you know, have a storm in, in that amount of time. So, at least from my standpoint, I don't feel like that um, these policies are, are significant enough to protect <coughs> our water quality and our fisheries from these facilities. Are there any other questions or comments? All right, it, if we have no other questions or comments, I believe we are wrapping up for the evening. Thank you guys so, so much. Thank you to all our new members. Thank you for the wonderful information. This has been super helpful and I'm sure we'll be continuing conversations offline. Um, anything else before we close? I got a question. Cool. Uh, how, how do I go about getting everybody's uh, phone number and email address? Uh, that would be something I think would be helpful. So, um, I can answer that. This is Laura. Um, I, uh, so. With marine fisheries, we are not allowed to share your personal information, so I cannot pass out your information. You can contact each other if you would like to give out your phone numbers. You okay. can ask okay. me to provide your phone number to other AC members, but I need it in an email. <laughs> and um, it is not the usual case that state agencies have that much protection for personal information, but the Marine Fisheries Commission does. So that's a really specific um, that's a really specific request that you can absolutely make 
So if you're okay with me sharing your information, just email me and ask me to email it to the group. And I'm okay. happy to do that. Yep. Thank you. Is this Paula? You're this is Laura. We're practically the same person, so I'll answer to either name. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> in, in the case of work, <laughs> you can call on either of us. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you guys so, so much. I believe we are wrapping up the, the meeting and we can call it adjourned. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you so have much. Good night. Thanks, guys. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you.